In this episode, we catch up with The Doors as they release their second album in one year, their sophomore effort, Strange Days. Stay with us. Get ready for the 3324 Podcast, where lifelong friends Dean Legiro and Eric Coover share their love of all things music and movies. Dean has directed short films and is a music trivia buff. And Eric, trained in audio engineering, brings his extensive knowledge of music and film to the conversation as they discuss, debate, and celebrate their favorite albums, films, and much more. Welcome, friends, to the 3324 Podcast. If you're watching us on YouTube, do us a favor. Uh, go ahead and hit the like button and then also hit the subscribe button. It helps to support the channel. If you're on YouTube, you you know that uh, it's an important part of our growth uh, <laughs> in the uh, in the video space. Eric, is that a fair assessment? Yes, but did you just say chattel? <laughs> yeah, did YouTube. You just... That's what it's called. That's what it's called? Okay. Channel. Yeah, we have a that's I video, you, right? I said chattel. <laughs> no, no, chattel. Like chat, like chattel, you know. Chattel is, is Yaddle's uh, illegitimate daughter. <laughs> Was chattel. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't know who Yaddle is, you're not watching enough Star Wars. Right. How yeah. are you doing, Eric? I'm doing good. Yourself? I'm good. Listen, do you do you hear that? Do I hear what? I Listen, hear nothing. Exactly. There are no guests on this episode. That's right. What was the last time we, we went like, guest we went like guest frenzy and we've had like well, almost like we're not, we're, we can't be alone anymore. No, no, no. But here we are. But here we are. But here we are. Well, it's the music, right? We haven't done a music one in a while. Yeah. That's, I think not that's, what we you did know. with guests, right? That's true. Here we are <laughs> alone at last. <laughs> yeah. It's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah. I, awesome. I was it's thinking awesome. about that today. I'm like, wow. Okay. There's actually no one else. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually going to have to talk. Right? Jesus. <laughs> so anyway, thank you for joining us each week. If you're finding us for the first time, it's usually as disorganized as it sounds, but that's half the fun mm. is that we uh, we talk about the music and movies that uh, shaped our lives and hopefully stuff that uh, you connect with. And if not, uh, you come on the journey with us and and, uh, and check out some of the stuff that we like. Um, so we thank you, uh, each and every one of you individually. Mm -hmm. I'm saying it's everybody at once, but it's it's an individual for each person. That's right. Customized. Yeah. Least, thank you. Blank. We would like to think so in our heads anyway. Yeah. Fill in the blank. Thank <laughs> thank you. Every blank. person just so, so thank you, one and all. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank yeah. you, thank you. We can't we can't do it all, but we we do thank you and appreciate <laughs> it. And uh spread the word. Mm -hmm. Sharing is caring, like the care bears say, like we always say, that uh uh yeah, help us out. <laughs> like I said, if you're on YouTube, throw a subscribe our way, that will help. If you're listening to us. Uh, go ahead and share it on your socials or or if you're someone that's uh, looking for an interesting and quirky podcast, I think we fit the bell. Yeah. And we throw in a decent amount of information too. We do. We do. We this, do. This, this, we take, uh, we take uh, that seriously. I don't know. Yeah, I think we do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, to say that it's useless information, I, I just, you know. No, it's not useless. It's, it's, it's stuff that we uh, <laughs> no, we take it. We take that part of it seriously. We don't, you know, we we have a good time with the content. We do, but we we certainly take the uh, the presentation of the information seriously. Meaning, we don't mm -hmm. uh, we don't cut corner. We don't go to the guy down on the corner and say, "Hey, tell me about you know, tell me about this." <laughs> right? What do you know? What do you know about this movie? You know? <laughs> yeah. You know. I don't know that there is a guy in the corner that provides that. If there is, no, uh, you know, he's bright. <laughs> if there is, well, I haven't found him yet. But. It's like that guy that comes out of the, the alleyway, you know, oh, bum from the yeah. dark. Hey, you know, <laughs> job, you bum. <laughs> he ends up being a singer. So you, you start a bum. <laughs> you start a bum. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, we're well. Let's let's get to. It. We're going to be talking. Uh, Before this we do, look look what I have in my hand. This is my brand new mug, courtesy that is a great of, mug of our brand new shop. Yeah, that uh, Dean founded. Go to and, our, our our shop. It's uh, retrolifegifts.etsy.com, yep. and we've got uh, not just uh, not just logo stuff because not everyone wants to like wear podcast stuff, but a lot of uh, cool designs that are all original designs that, mm -hmm. that uh, we have there. So you can support the show that way too. We're really just shilling. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to, this is going to be like QVC pretty soon. We're just going to be showing the products. So, like that's going to be the episode is, you know, notice the sheen on the mug, <laughs> it, 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 the craftsmanship of it. <laughs> anyway. And episode 127, the spring collection. And it's just going to be like a QVC episode of just the stuff, you know, that's right. 
of, <laughs> you know, we'll need to get some models and stuff, but uh, right. Yeah. Anyway, this okay. is our, our second crack at a doors album. Yeah. Um, and I, if I'm not mistaken, this is you, you, this was one you were interested in doing, right? Yeah. This was now, now our very, first of all, let me, okay. I need to fix a, a wrong. That's been two years that it's been bothering me. Okay. For two years, it's been bothering me. On our LA Woman episode, which was like our third episode, mm-hmm. okay, mm-hmm. I I committed an almost unforgivable sin, and I need to correct it now. Okay, I called the album the album previous to LA Woman. I called it Roadhouse Blues. It is Morrison Hotel. Hmm. I was nervous. We were early in in podcasting. I was just a skinny little kid who didn't know anything uh, and was <laughs> afraid in front of the microphone. And I referred to Morrison hotel as roadhouse blues. The album is Morrison hotel, Morrison hotel, yep. uh, an, a, an error correction, two years in the making. Oh. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, 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 it's great that you were thinking about it all this time, I suppose, but I, I not, you know, it's no, not a good thing. Nobody called you out on it. Right. Or, no. did, or, or, no, I it's called somebody. myself out it when I first when I listened to it. I'm like Roadhouse Blues. So back. Yeah, hell's your problem, man. <laughs> What's with you, man? Listen, listen, a lot of those early episodes we did, where there's a lot of you know yeah, clubs. There's a lot of things that I think for, we for a self avowed like Doors fanatic, hmm. that's unforgivable. You 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 know. I don't know. I don't know about that. How do you I... show you? How do you show your face at work the next day? <laughs> How, you, do, you can't. How dare you, sir? How dare I've been you? hiding for two years from certain people because of <laughs> I'm afraid of a confrontation about it. You actually wanted to do Morrison Hotel. I think yeah. you, when we started talking about doing another Doors, you were like, let's do Morrison Hotel. And I, I was like, well, I, I like Strange Days. Yeah. Um, it's my problem. I guess my, per, my you see, that's the thing. There's no bad Doors album. Um, well, but um no, this was a good choice, though. If, if, if we, my favorite, I think it, it's pretty it, much my favorite of of, of theirs. Yeah, really. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's. I think it's a good contrast. If we had done Morrison Hotel, yeah. there th- those two are too too close to each other and too similar. Yeah, yeah, they're they're similar, pretty, similar in, in 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 or they they were getting close to being similar. Um, let's get with the stats with this, and then we'll we'll get into this one, which is mm-hmm. um, yeah, this is a good one. They're all great, but yeah. anyway, this was released in September of nineteen sixty seven. So I was, uh, I was born already. We celebrating a, celebrating a birthday in September of that year. Yeah. Uh, this was produced by Paul Rothschild. He produced all of the Doors uh, albums up until the last one, mm-hmm. up until LA Woman, and then just the relationship just exploded. Uh, there were only two singles released uh, from this album: "People Are Strange," which hit number twelve; "Love Me Two Times" hit number twenty-five. Wow! Mm. I thought they were. Uh, you know, people are strange. Sure. Number 12, love me two times. I didn't realize it was that far down in the charts. Uh, did hit number three on the billboard album charts. And it, uh, it only went one times platinum. This was actually the, the poorest selling. Yeah. Doors album. Of one course it platinum is. means, uh, means a million copies. Of course I it is. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, yeah, there's got, I mean, just uh, out of all the Beatles albums, there's gotta be one that's the worst selling. So of in every artist is going to be a worst selling to, just to what degree is this the worst selling? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I, I didn't look it up. Is it is it by millions? Is it off that much, or is it you know is, is the next one two million? You know, I I didn't look that up, but it is the worst, the least sell. I don't want to say worst selling. Yeah, it sold the least amount of copies because I don't want worst to be a connotation that this is a bad album because it is decidedly not. No, no, but uh, you know, there's I, of course critics. You know, a few, you know, they one 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 person pointed out that it was like their worst selling and i guess the way he put it was not in a a terribly uh you know good way he was yeah. he's, he wasn't being polite let's put it that way yeah, it's, it's, worst, it's, you know. have a positive connotation when you say it's the worst selling album. right you know but, it's, uh, but it's, of course it's the worst money. thing for you know because it's always i <laughs> i always tend to pick the worst of everything, right? All my favorite movies are, are they didn't do well at the box office, <laughs> you know, but, but they're all is- stuff. I mean, it's, you know, I, I, you know, this particular album, um, because it's just weird, I guess. I don't know. I don't know why it's, you know, it has that sort of, you know, we'll yeah, get into it's, that, it's, but, you know, yeah, it's, it's not that far off. I mean, this is not no. like this album is certainly not an outlier. 
Um, and, and the way I thought of it like when, when revisiting this album is the, the Doors made six, six studio albums. They actually made, they actually made nine, but they made three after Jim Morrison died. Mm-hmm. They made two yeah. without him. And then they made an American prayer, which isn't really a Doors album. It's the poetry. They put music to it. A lot, a lot, a lot of whatever. Yeah. They made six studio albums with Morrison. It's very easy. This is a really simple equation. The, the first two albums, their debut, The Doors and Strange Days are, are the same. They're sim- it's the same kind of trajectory. Mm-hmm. The next two, Waiting for the Sun and The Soft Parade, are like their pop era. It's a little more poppier. It's Hello, I Love You and Touch mm-hmm. Me. And then Morrison Hotel and L.A. Woman are them evolving into a blues band, right? So it's very easy to kind of take their discography because it was only six albums and, the, and it does match really well because mm-hmm. – most of the songs on this album was were written during their, you know, their when they were a new band, when they were when they were working on their debut. So this right. is kind of, and I think that's the way it is with a lot of bands, right? Is they have, you know, when you when they get signed, they have a, a wealth of material. You pick the best for your your album. Mm-hmm. If it gets popular, you got to get something out pretty quick. And that's this is what happened with the Doors. Is their first album? This came out in September of '67. Their debut came out in January of the same year. Yeah. So it kind of took off, light my fire, um, all that kind of stuff. And so they went right back into the studio. So they had this material, the stuff that they didn't use for the most part, uh, to to pull from. So that's why the, 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 these they're very similar. This kind of continues the psychedelic, the psychedelic pop mm-hmm. or psychedelic rock that the door. You know, they they would start transitioning in the next album away from this. Yeah, the, the first two albums are very much of that psychedelic sounding pop music yeah yeah this but this one um is decidedly i think uh well it's, it's as if to say you know hey we're not done yet we're not done with our debut yeah. you know so we have this other all this other stuff that we, we might have wanted to put on the original album if if you know but there were a few songs on the original album that that might you might think that you know well it's a little bit different than what say the end and you know there's some you know some psychedelic a lot of psychedelia mm-hmm. on there but but this album to me is like from beginning to end is is one complete thought it's it's mm-hmm. like a mood it's more of a mood piece like the entire album yep. says pretty much the same thing like every song yeah is is of the same uh style or you know or genre if you want to call you know want to say that but it's just it it definitely you you could consider this a concept album of, of sorts you know because of the the darkness of it. And, you know, they kind of just, you know, we, we need to get this out because maybe they knew psychedelia wasn't going to last. It would, it would be gone in, in just a couple of years, I guess it kind of yeah. transitioned to more prog kind of took off and, and did other things with it and that kind of thing. You, know, mm-hmm. you know, groups were writing 25 minute long songs here. They did it in three. And I, I was looking at the time signatures on all these uh, songs and there's no, except for the last track, yeah, no song exceeds three and a half minutes. Yeah, they're 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 in and yeah. out with these. That's right. Um, yeah, which is which is again that I mean that's pretty much the way the doors were. Their 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 stock and trade was close the album with an epic mm-hmm. song. And if and if you look at the doors dis- discography, the six albums they put out, with without exception, the the last song is the longest to varying yeah. degrees. Um, nor, you know, you've got the end, which is 10 or 11 minutes. You've got when the music's over on this, which is 10 or 11 minutes. Yeah. Five to one isn't as long on the, on the next album on waiting for the sun, but it's the longest song on the album, Mm -hmm. you know, and then on the soft parade, you've got the soft parade, which is an epic and Maggie McGill, which isn't a terribly long song, but it's the longest on the album. And of Mm -hmm. course, riders on the storm. So that was kind of their, their thing was, you know, doing an album and then having this expansive thing at the end, which was really more uh, kind of attuned to what their live experience was. It was more free form, you know, the, those, the, that final song would always be a little bit more free form, mm-hmm. a little more improvisational, just kind of going wherever, you know, Morrison could expand on, on, on lyrical content. And then the band could also expand musically. It just wasn't all Morrison on those longer songs. Actually, sometimes it was more, oh, sure. Yeah, the the accents and 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 the backing that the that the other doors were providing as well. So well, definitely um, took you somewhere on these songs too. I mean, you're you know even on the studio material. I mean, it, it, as you listen to it on in, in a room, even you're, you're just kind of like <laughs> you don't even have to 
use it. You know, you don't need anything to to help enhance the experience of of some of this stuff. So I I I, I always appreciated that about their music. Yeah, you know, and, and the, 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 yeah. the big difference between this one and the first uh, the the first album and this album is uh stylistically and sonically there's they're the same but the first album was recorded on four tracks Mm -hmm. what happened in between the recording of this album and and strange i mean of the debut album in strange days was sergeant pepper they heard they heard sergeant Uh, they heard sergeant pepper and they got themselves uh, they got their hands on an a track so Mm -hmm. they started to then experiment with and, and you can hear it there's a lot of backwards cymbal work from from John Densmore on some of the songs. It's like like it's and it's backwards, so they're fooling around with that, processing you know Morrison's vocals through a Moog synthesizer or Moog Moog. I think it's I think it's Moog. I think it's Moog, but everyone pronounced it as Moog. Okay, processing his vocals through that and and just you know they they really went for that experimentation, which gives this one that trippier feel than, than the first, even though the first album, it's kind of, it's kind of like the bare bones versions of psychedelic stuff. Mm-hmm. Now that they're into eight tracks, you really f- like, a, like a song, like strange days. It sounds like it's, it's, it's recorded underwater. It has like this, war- this really this warbly, warbly, yeah. warbly feel. Cause Morrison was singing through the synthesizer and the guitars have that weird core, you know, um, and, you know, for the first album, Paul Rothschild didn't want Robbie Krieger to use any effects. He was just like, Oh, I don't want this to be overused. He's very controlling. Mm-hmm. Um, so for the second album, they, they kind of got the toolbox and like, okay, let's kind of start fooling with this. And let's kind of, yeah. uh, we've, we've got all these tracks to use and we're inspired and we, we're seeing other bands do it. So let's jump in. And this is kind of like their, you know, their Sergeant Peppery kind of album, meaning as far as experimentation goes, you know, cause they would kind of pull it back after this dial it more towards straightforward stuff. Yeah, that's probably why I like it so much because it has that, you know, because you're, you know, we're, we're both into the the sort of experimental in, in kind of stuff that we always talk about. But this, this is that album for me. And this was the album, like you mentioned, Robbie Krieger. This is, this is what made me take notice of him as a guitar player. You know, some of the things he was doing on this, his guitar, it, it sounds like a vocal, like it's like there's, mm. there's parts of the song where you swear it's a voice and it's his guitar, like this weird sort of, you know, he's using a bottleneck slide, but he's using it just to accent certain, yeah. you know, things. And it's, it's, it, I think it's just great. Um, but yeah, uh, they, they kind of started to kind of, you know, you know, they were gigging, they were the, like the house band at the whiskey, you know, yeah. which is one thing. But then when you start becoming a recording act, you know, it's a little bit different and there's some different disciplines that you need. So, you know, their debut, as strong as it was, I I think, uh, you know, this didn't sell as much, but I think it's just as powerful, you know, when you've got Moonlight Drive, mm-hmm. which was like the first, that's like the, that's like the origin of the doors. It, you know, the famous origin story is, is, you know, Morrison and Ray Manzarek met on the beach and, yep. and, you know, oh, I want to start this band. And Morrison's like, I've got these lyrics and it was Moonlight Drive, which they'd recorded earlier, but just, um, they, they recorded it for the debut. It wasn't satisfied with it or, or, yeah. you know, and they re-recorded it, you know? Um, and it's just got a classic, you know, you've got classics like that on, on here. And love me, <laughs> like I said, love me two times and people are yeah. strange. I mean, those are, you know, people are strange is like the psychedelic anthem of the sixties. It, it, you don't need much more than people are strange. That's right. You know, to really, to really uh, drive, drive it home in, in the sixties, what was going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's interesting too. the, you know, like you mentioned strange days about the, his uh, Morrison putting his vocals through the synthesizer. It's, it's, you know, in the remix of the album, like the, the, I think it was the 50th anniversary, they actually separated his voice from that. You know, it's interesting to yeah. note that they, and I didn't like that. I didn't like that. They did that. I, I, I like that weird effect. As soon as they, yeah. as soon as he starts to sing, you can't, you, you really can't, you, his voice is like right in the middle of that weird, like, brrr, you know, like that, brrr, you know, that's like verbally yeah. kind of thing. And I, I just, I, 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 some, a lot, I have to, I have to be honest. A lot of the remixes I don't care for. Really? I don't, I don't all the remixes. I was loving them. Remixes did back then, like 2008. Cause they, yeah. they were totally different. And I'm talking about the, the anniversary editions now. Oh, okay. The, 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 they did a four, the 40th anniversary. I yeah, those were amazing. Cause you hear stuff you've never heard before. I forgot what it was. Yeah. But every album had like, and it was, uh, yeah, those were remixed and, and vocals were brought up and, and you heard things that you didn't hear and uh, you know, different, different, and it had some extra tracks. It was, I, exciting. I like those. It was exciting because that stuff sounded new. 
It sounded fresh. It sounded almost yeah. like they uh, they updated their sound to make it sound like a a, a modern band. Yeah, the masters must have been in really good amazing. shape because they yeah. sounded. You know, yeah, yeah. I remember playing, and unfortunately, uh, we we can't get you too hyped up about it because those are not available on streaming services. Unfortunately, if you go to listen mm-hmm. on Spotify, you're just going to hear the standard. Do- you know, that's one of the bad things about streaming. Is the good thing is you can get almost anything, but then the bad thing is you actually can't get everything because. There are some of these, re- like these remixed releases. We talked about it in our Pet Sounds episode. You know, mm-hmm. the, the box set was available, then it's gone, and it's gone. You know, there they have, there is the only thing they do have on I think on Spotify they have the 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 compilation is the future starts here, and I think it's just the greatest hits. But it, with, with that remix, so because I yeah. I've, I've listened to you know both that but but you're right they don't have all the albums you know remixed yeah, which you know, would which be great you know, so it would be yeah that that's one check mark for eric of the uh purveyor of owning the physical media and having <laughs> having it right i mean i have them i just have to dig yeah. them out i, I actually I, I did rip them but mm-hmm. um but yeah so we don't want to get you too hyped up on that and say oh they're, they're talking about the remixes but i can't yeah, because since them, they've, huh? they've they've re-released these albums as anniversary editions and i, I don't care for them i don't yeah. care for the what, what they did you know the re- the original. I'd rather listen to the original album, the original mix, and and it, it's it's better. It's just better. So, right. Yeah. So from the uh, from the catastrophic uh, career decision file, uh, <laughs> start, starting with starting with the the first album that you know the you know the Doors are are a four piece band, mm-hmm. uh, but not the not the typical four piece. You've got a vocalist, you've got a keyboardist, a guitarist, and a drummer, and you don't have a bass player. Yeah, and Ray Manzarek would would play the bass notes with his uh, with his left hand, um, which was great. It's it's great for live stuff, but in the studio they they started to use a bass player starting from the first album to augment the sound. Uh, his this gentleman Larry Nectel from the uh, from Pet he played on Pet Sounds. He was one mm-hmm. of the Wrecking Crew. He played uh, on the first album, as did this gentleman called uh, by the name of Doug Luban. Mm-hmm. Um, Doug Lubon played, I think, on seven out of the ten tracks on this album. Yeah. Uh, he was in a band called Clear Light at the time, which was also being produced by Paul Rothschild. The Doors said, hey, Doug, you know what? We want to make you a member. We, you know, we want to make you a member of the Doors. Like, it, it, we need, a, you know, let's just get the get a bass player. Nah, I'm going to stay with Clear Light. <laughs> I'm sorry, who the fuck is Clear Light? Because I've never heard of them before, like... <laughs> Never. <laughs> yeah, I. I mean, he he would continue. I. He would continue to play on the Doors albums. He would play bass on. He would be on Waiting for the Sun. He would be on on Morrison yeah. Hotel and, and Soft Parade to a lesser and lesser extent. Mm-hmm. You know, and then once they got to L.A. Woman, you had uh, Jerry Chef. But this guy just turned it down. Um, oddly enough, you know where he reappeared? Mm-mm. He became Billy Squire's bass player. Really. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> if you go look, if you go look up Billy Squire and Doug Lubon, you re- you'll recognize him. I recognize him from Billy Squire because he was like a kid. He was like twenty years old when he was playing with the Doors. Ugh. He was like really young. Yeah. You know. So by the time he got to Billy Squire, he was only in his thirties. Well, he was that, still a young guy. That might explain. Well, I don't know. Maybe that explains why. Maybe he, he's know. just devoted to his. Yeah. Was it his band? Did he start who, that? Uh, who, clear- who cares? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, he's, he's, I believe he's deceased. So rest, rest in peace, but you know, the doors are asking you to be there ba- to join their, to join their band. Right. Yeah. Well, clear light. I've never even heard of them. So it's not even like, Oh, this is like a, you know, this, that, or the other thing type of band that maybe had a hit. I've, I've never even heard of them, mm. you know? And he's like, oh, I'm going to stay with clear light. It's like, all right, you do that. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean they kept you know. Wow. So I mean, he may as well just have joined because they kept they continued to use them album after album because they yeah. they needed that 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 rounded that rounded and you can hear it on on strange days, especially now because in, in eight tracks, you know, you really hear that there's a bass player there. You know, oh, Ray Manzarek yeah. is really getting the support. It's great for mm. on tour if you're going to go bare bones, but they even used bass players on 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 tour as well. Um, and there's what, a lot of isolated bass on some of these songs. Yeah, oh, like those, like those you, lo- you lost little, the... you lost little girl is yeah. is all bass. That's all. That's right. Yep. Yeah, that's all bass. That song. It's mm-hmm. like doom, 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 doom. Yeah. It's like that is not doom, a, that is not a keyboard. Yeah, right? that is absolutely not a keyboard. So so they, you know, the the doors weren't so regimented that they're like, okay, you know, this is what our band is. You know, they where where they needed that support. Mm-hmm. 
they took it and it wore and it, it just rounded out their sound too. I, I just think it really helped having having a bass player on, on the studio. Yeah. Stuff just kind of you know, they, they you, you you don't have to go it alone like that, you know. And and even Ray Manzarek realized that. He goes, It's it's just not it's not full enough and it's, it doesn't flow like a, you know, playing the bass notes on, on the keyboard doesn't flow the way a bass player does. So they had, right. they had Doug doubling, doubling Ray Manzarek on that stuff, which it really takes, uh, it takes pressure perfect. off of Ray Manzarek too. I mean, you're, you know, you're trying to do this stuff live and you're trying to, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's kind of, he's trying to be cre- creative as it is playing. Yeah. things like the harpsichord. Like who plays harpsichord in a, in a yeah. rock and roll band. Right. I mean, that is such an odd odd instrument to 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 incorporate into this stuff but it uh, but he did it and you know and so he was on the cusp of who you know why would i want to worry about bass you know it's like the bass notes and you know you know we he gets somebody who could do that better than i can because all i'm doing is just you know keeping yeah, the rhythm very you know? rudimentary stuff right, you know? exactly. yeah so right right ray, ray yeah. manzarek where, where does he fit in no you never hear anybody talk about and you never hear anybody really talk about great keyboardists anyway you never hear, you always hear great guitarists and you hear great drummers it's usually in the you never you never hear talk about great keyboardists where did where does he fit in no i um, is he forgot is he forgotten i don't if anybody were to talk about great keyboard especially in the rock vein mm-hmm. it would he would probably be one of the first people that people would mention i'm sure um, is it the same as p- playing the piano? I mean, is, is he the same as a I, Billy Joel and an Elton John? I, no, I, I or is he like a so. Keith? Em- is he a Keith Emerson? Yeah, and a Tony ba- and a Tony Banks. Is it you know where where is he, where is Ray Manzarek in there? Yeah, I mean, it would. I suppose it would have to depend on on his composing duties as well. I think a lot of these keyboardists they they tend to stand out a little bit more because they're they're actual composers. They go on to do like people like Tony Bank. They go on to do like orchestral arrangements and things mm-hmm. like that. Ray was he did so he did some soundtrack work. Ray, yeah, he was pretty. Um, I mean, he I would say he was pretty solid in 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 just in the rock vein. And and you probably hear a lot more talk about jazz keyboardists. I mean, that's mm-hmm. more their their realm. I think. Because with jazz, yeah. it's like they they stand out more than I think probably jazz guitar. At least it used to be mm-hmm. that way in the old days. And I I consider like Ray Manzarek more of a jazz player. You know, like him yeah, and jazz, jazz and blues. Him, yeah, him and Densmore uh, definitely. I think they're. So where, you know, where do you put where do you put Densmore? Oh, he's he's in a choir. He's in a choir taste. I, I like John Densmore, but he's not a straight. He's not a pocket drummer. No, you know. He, 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 you know, he fit with the doors because the doors were so improvisational that he could get away with the stuff that he would do. If he was in any other band, he probably wouldn't fit. Like he, he was just too, too out of the pocket and too, too, you know, everybody came from like a different discipline. So he was really kind of jazzy. Yeah. You know, Robbie Krieger was kind of flamenco and finger picking finger style. And Ray was kind of like blues and you have these well, three that's the thing. ingredients that don't really mix, but, but together it, it made sense because they all kind of let eat, they all gave each other the room to breathe. Yeah. You know, and, and especially on this you, album, you hear, you hear Densmore has got some, you know, he's always got strange stuff going on, on especially on strange days. That's what's uh, so great about this band is that they're so unique, musically speaking. And that's why, you know, everybody's always about Morrison and, you know, I love Morrison and I, what he was all about. And sometimes I felt like he was full of shit. I think I mentioned this on LA yeah. woman, you know, so, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I didn't, it's easy to buy into the mystique of Jim Morrison. Sure. He's a, you know, he's a sexy guy. He's got this poetry thing going on and, you know, that kind of thing. But um, I think the fact that he was more or less a crooner adds to that as well. Right. I mean, it's like, he wasn't yeah. a straight out like singer, so to speak. Like he's like, you know, he would, his voice was yeah. always very in a low register. He was always like, you know, he yeah, was I don't scraping. think, I don't think it- I don't think this would have worked with a straight ahead. There were, there were just so and many, behind them. Well, like you say, there's yeah. so many different extremes to this band. Like they, they just, they never do anything the same, but quite the yeah. same. Yeah. And I think you that's know? what makes it work is that that's right. If you, if you put a straight ahead rock combo behind him, I don't know what that would sound like. Wouldn't, you know, like it part, part of the doors, the mystique of the doors is that the music sounds so strange as well. And dark, That's right. That's right. You know, the, the, the music itself gets dark to match, especially like, like when the music's over, that is just so, you know, like, 
like Densmore's doing his own his own thing, his mm-hmm. own fills, and then Robbie Krieger's just doing like little like just really small little <laughs> licks. Well, he's, you know, they're all like in their own zone, but 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 then the zones kind of come together, and then Morrison yeah. is just kind of laying just laying lines of poetry over it that yeah. It, it, it's not even really music. It's more like, it, you know, like, like something when the music's over, isn't really music. It's more like a piece of art. Yeah. It, because it's so, it's so abstract. It's, just, it's such an abstract thing. It, it keep it goes back to the themes of a standard song, but, it, but just like, you know, the soft parade and the end, you know, th- those pieces are more like artistic statements than they are like, Oh, oh for sure. Know, yeah. Like, for like, sure. like, Oh, we're going to make a record. We're going to put the horns, you know, we're going to do this and that. It's like, it's yeah. not, it's not regimented like the pet, like pet sounds or Sergeant Pepper. They're using but, the technology, but they're using it in a different way. It's funny, you know, because my <clears throat> my oldest son, uh, he, the Doors are his favorite band. Ah, welcome <laughs> they, aboard. They used to be like they used to. It used to be the Beatles, but now you know he you know, he heard the Doors and he was gone. You know, so he he just loves this band, but he doesn't like Soft Parade. He's like, I can't stand with the. Whole. I said, really? yeah, but that was, but that was, but that was part of the process, though. That was part yeah. of their their thing is that they they would do something different like that. They would add horns, they would add strings, they would they weren't it's got wild. It's got wild child on it. How could they, you not? They, yeah, they would. They they weren't afraid to go there. You know, and that's yeah. the exciting about this band. It was like they're constantly moving. And I would say, you know, for you know, you mentioned art. Yeah, they're probably one of the first art rock bands. You know, this yeah. is pre Prague, uh, but but they were they were able to do this stuff in a, in a three four minute song, which is astounding to me. Yeah. You know, I think better than the Beatles, in in my opinion, because they, they, this stuff was just so they took it so somewhere else. It was so out there. And yeah, uh, it, it dealt more with it. like you know the the Beatles yeah. were were more like okay, experimentation and and pushing the boundaries of songwriting of creating. The doors occupied a different space. Like that was, and it's funny. It's funny what you just said about your son because I went, I went through that, and pro, you know, yeah, uh, you know, I had my Beatles period, mm-hmm. and it was all Beatles all the time. And I remember distinctly thinking to myself, "Well, what else is there? Like, wh- if the Beatles are the greatest band, and I'm, I've consumed everything I could about them, then what is what is left?" Yeah, and mm-hmm. little did I know, I would get into after the Beatles, I got into the Doors heavily into the doors and then after the doors yeah. i'm like well what what else is like what else is left like like i kept on questioning after i i had those phases i'm like well well what's after this little did i know it would be the beach boys it would like circle it would kind of yeah. leapfrog but it would leapfrog backwards it would skip over the beatles and go even earlier so it's you know the the discovery of music is it is an interesting thing just when you think you're done um yeah even when I was questioning it, I'm like, well, if the Beatles are the best thing and I've already gotten into them, what else is there? And it's like, well, there, there's more out there. It's and and the, the doors occupy a different a different headspace, a different state of mind, and a different kind of uh, That's right. You know, it, it's it li- you know, I don't really listen to like the Beatles and then the doors. Like I listen to the Beatles, <laughs> like like you listen to the Beatles, you're listening to the Beatles. And then I want yeah, to go they, listen to the doors. It's something different. I don't gotta put on the beat. I'm not gonna put on rubber soul, then uh, then put on, you know, Morrison Hotel or something like that. Just, <laughs> like right, it's just right. it does, you know, it's not the same, it's the same decade, same era, but it's like it's almost like it's almost like different genres just because of of the material, you know, the, the doors weren't afraid to go to those dark places, you know. It's always um, it's always it, it, it always interesting to note the Beatles could very well be okay, considered the greatest band ever. Sure, you know? we'll say it. And, um, but there is, but the point is, is that the, the fact is, is that there were other bands already at the same time doing their thing as well. And they might have credited the Beatles like, oh, they made a masterpiece. But we're already working on our own stuff too, you know? So I, I, I don't feel like any of these bands get that kind of acknowledgement from from you know from rock critics or or, or you know they never get the, the everything oh everybody owes everything to the beatles and i i just i don't agree with that I, I i feel like everybody has their own point of view certainly this band had their something completely like you just mentioned they you know something completely different in another space and and the psychedelic thing yeah the way the technique the recording techniques you know uh beatles might have done it first 
but also like it surprises me too that they, they it took a while for them to even get an A track because they were already using A track in America long before the Beatles were. So yeah. so cheap, cheap ass EMI studio or Parlophone. Surprisingly, <laughs> surprisingly enough, why didn't the Doors have already have an A track yeah. for their first album? You know I, I think I mean? because they, I think it was done on the cheap. It was like I think it was yeah. like ten thousand dollars that they made the record for. So it was kind right. of like, you know, you're not going to spend the big bucks on it. You know, back then everybody and their mother had a band, right? Everybody had yeah. a band. True. So so you know everybody made you know Clearlight, whoever they are, mm -hmm. you know they must have made a. I'm sure they made a record. So you you do it on the cheap. Oh, okay. Now we've got a we've got a hot commodity. Let's kind of you know now now there there's a little bit more faith from Electra, who was who was the label that, that the Doors mm -hmm. were on. Um, and, and it's their willingness. I'm sure, I'm sure if the door said, no, we want to, you know, let's do the four track and, and I'm sure the record company would be like, sure, it's cheaper, you know, yeah. and it'll be quicker because we won't have to do all these overdubs. So I think it's also the band and what they're, what they have access to in the beginning. You only have access to a four track. This is what we're doing. We're making your album on. You mm -hmm. guys got to do the best you can with it. Yeah. You yeah. know, and then, then, but then this other revolution happens. Like you say, the Beatles, you know, they're always going to be the the the, the credit for market the, they're they're always they're always going to be the the marker for everything in the 60s that happened because they just their evolution was so quick it was so brilliant it was so precise yeah. that you can't help but use them as a yardstick to measure every other sure. band and, and what they were doing so so everybody's going to get overshadowed but like i said in, in this way this in strange days in their way was their this was their experimentation album of where yeah. they can kind of Go in because after this, in, in in waiting for the sun, which is probably one of my favorite albums. After this, is much more subdued, less psychedelic, much more introspective and mellow. And that's Zach's favorite. And, and warmer. Yeah. It's it's not as a you know a uh, you know the the psychedelic stuff can can be kind of you know scary if you're not you know just just yeah <laughs> you, you know if if you're looking for just regular pop stuff. Not that it's it's like talking about murder except for the end. <laughs> um, but, but, the, but Morrison's imagery, right. Cause, cause of the poetry he was writing, it's very yeah. abstract, you know, and you have to, it's not like she loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did that with touch me, which was, which probably why your son doesn't like it. It's so <laughs> it's so anti what the doors were, right. You know, the, the dark imagery, like horse latitudes, just the creepiest thing ever, you know, it's kind of. <laughs> you know, the, the, the weird P the echoey piano and it's got the horses and, and Mars and screaming these, you know, the, these poetry lines, you know, mm -hmm. so the doors weren't afraid to go to those darker places that the Beatles might just kind of glance over while they're, while they're evolving, the Beatles would kind of touch on that, you know, Lennon would probably touch on those darker themes a little bit and yeah. then move off. And then it would go on to the next evolution. Whereas the doors kind of, you know, always, you know, even though their, their music, the music itself kind of changed the lyrical content of Morrison and, and Krieger and Rob, cause Robbie Krieger wrote a lot of these hits um, kind of remain consistent. Their, their, their themes always stayed the same, I think. Mm -hmm. Whereas, whereas the Beatles, it was like, you know, she loves you, hold your hand. And then it got to like, let it be. And, and some other stuff. I think the doors had a shorter lifespan as well. Um, and it was always just you know, cause Morrison was like the key songwriter and the, the guy you had more of a consistent message and it was just his, his abstract lyrics. But boy, what a presence they made. Yeah. What a, what a, you know, their fingerprints, you know, blows my mind that it's just, it's all happened in that short amount of time. Yeah. And it's like, it's done, you know, like six albums. They, you know, they did carry on of course, without Jim, uh, you know, but it wasn't close to what they did. No, Ray, you know, Ray Manzarek has, has always tried to, uh, yeah fashion himself as a lead singer he just doesn't have the <laughs> you know the, the only song i like that he ever sang was you need me which was uh yeah. you know which, which yeah. is kind of just a bluesy song he's not you know you know a, a, you know and they had talked about getting iggy pop at the time after morrison passed away there was even talk of trying to get mccartney on bass which would be just ludicrous he would never right he would never do yeah. it you know the, the doors were these four people mm-hmm because any other guitar player is not Robbie Krieger because he's got a particular style, you know, and you can't just get a straight ahead drummer to fill in for, for John Densmore. The, the, those four people are what makes like unhappy girl, the, the song that it is, you know, and, and I can't see your, your face in my mind, like these atmospheric things, because these guys are just so, mm -hmm. they're just so, in, they're so independent. They're like independent uh, artists, 
yeah. but they work together in a group. It's so, it's so strange. They're so disconnected. You know, you don't really hear Robbie Krieger playing along with Manzarek. Manzarek goes on his own tangents. Yeah, they're doing their own thing. Does it? Yep. And 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 it, they all do their own thing, and that's what that's what. It, and Morrison's doing his own thing too. So it's I, you know, can't beat a, a horse latitude to death. But um, <laughs> that that's really what that's really the mystique of the Doors is that they're not cohesive. But, but yet it all they makes are. sense. Yeah. But they are because because but they're they so di- because each one is so different. Each one is has such a different discipline. That's the word I'm looking for. They each have yeah. a different discipline. That when they come together, they it, it just kind of becomes more more of an art form than yeah. it does pop music. You know, which is which is kind of really the and that was the, the, the thing at the time too, of course, you know, the 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 psychedelia that was happening in the, especially in a <clears throat> in California. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, the airplane, yeah, Jefferson airplane, airplane you had yeah, Hendrix, you had, you know, all these, you know, yeah, you had the dead, of course, you know, so, you, and then, and of course, these like these pop bands that were trying to be like the Doors too, like these one hit wonders, and you know, they're sort of throwing this stuff out there, and it it disappeared just as quick as it came, um, but yeah, I mean, this their their stuff, wow, what an imprint they made, yeah, one of the most unique bands ever, and I don't, I don't, I, I don't. Are there any bands that sound like the Doors? Do you think modern today? Like, can anybody be? You listen to them and you say, "Oh my God, that's the Doors right there." I I can't think of. I'm sure there are. There has to be somebody who's trying to. I mean, vo- I mean, vocally. You know, I mean, there's, there's a couple that that try and go there. You know, uh, I mean, famously Eddie Vedder sat in for Morrison when when the Doors got inducted into the Hall of Fame. I mean, mm-hmm. he's. He's one of them. Ian Astbury from the cult toured mm-hmm. with the doors. It was the doors of the 21st century. He toured extensively as, as the kind of quote unquote lead singer of that band. So there are plenty of, plenty of people that have been influenced by him. Um, there's no one that sounds like him because he, I mean, he wasn't that great of a singer. He was, he was, <laughs> he was okay, but that, but that, that, and that wasn't the point, right? Like you mm-hmm. said, he was kind of a crooner. You know, he got the point across. It was more, the words he was using yeah how you know, he wasn't he, yeah, he wasn't such a great singer and, and you know doing different runs and stuff that wasn't what he did mm-hmm. uh, he was just out there and, and like you said sometimes the the image gets in the way of that you know yeah. the, and that you know we talked about that on the L, i think on the la woman episode where he took steps to get away from that lizard king clad in leather image you know and mm-hmm. started gaining weight and, and growing a beard smoking cigars and um you know, because because it's it's harder to be taken seriously when girls are screaming and and that's all they want and they just want the image of the of the lizard king as it yeah. were, um, and he's trying to do something you know trying to you know spread the message or spread the word and then there's that contempt that grows and of course you know unchecked alcohol use and then it's just it you know. It just becomes a disaster. This this year, this was released in September of 67. I believe it was December of 67. Morrison became the first person, rock star, to be arrested on stage <laughs> yeah. in, in New Haven, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. He, and so the same year that this came out, they were, the, the problems were already brewing, you know, like where, you know, I think that arrest in, in, in December in New Haven, he, you know, uh, he got maced backstage by a cop. There was a little misunderstanding. They didn't they didn't know who he was. And then he took that that rage and that ire uh, mm-hmm. out on stage, you know, and kind of directed it towards the crowd and the cops. And they just kind of and there's footage of him of them accosting him. And he's like wasted. Uh, <laughs> of course, you know, yeah. They they kind of take him off stage. And he's kind of like he doesn't even know what the hell's going on. And so he was he has the distinction of the first uh, rock act or performer. Uh, to be arrested on stage during a concert, mm. that that would kind of start the beginning of the end for him. Which would, would be a frustration for the rest of the band. I know Densmore yeah. especially would be. Everybody to corral him, yeah. you know, for the for the next album, for waiting for the sun, mm-hmm. multiple hundreds, some sometimes hundreds of takes. It would they would have to go through just to get him to get him right, and they would have to have people prop him up. I mean, he was just he was on a a, a quick train of destruction. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're talking what this was 67, 68, three years later, 70, 71, he's gone. You know, so you, this was a this was a pretty quick flame out. Do uh, you think went, that went, um because you know Manzarek and you know uh Densmore Krieger, they were very much like 
I would say virtuosic musicians in that sense. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. so do you think Jim was intimidated by that? You think, you know, at some point he realized, well, I don't measure up to these guys musically. You know, like you say, he wasn't the greatest singer. I'm a great, I, I write poetry, you know, is uh, that, I don't, is, I don't is think that, so, that was, that was his thing, right? His, 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 his virtuosic talent was words. Yeah. Right. That's what he brought. He, you know, it, it wasn't his voice that he brought. He brought the lyrics, mm -hmm. right? He, he, he put, words and emotions to the music that they were playing right though all those things were all symbiotic yeah they all kind of fit together so i don't think he was no i just think the the trappings of of success got to him the you know do whatever you want whenever you want that you know that lifestyle i think he romanticized that you know alcoholism as well and just kind of like it was a romantic way for a poet to you know to live yeah um that whole thing uh you know, kind of really living the excess you know literally Mm -hmm. You know, where, whereas, like you said, the other three were, you know, I'm sure they dabbled and they, you know, took their, I, I'm, I'm sure they did. I know they did. They, of course, their, yeah. those, their share of psychedelics. I mean, everybody was doing it, but he was just on a different level um, and whatever, whatever demons he was wrestling with. But I, I don't think he felt that he was less than because, yeah, he had, he, his part was the words, right? He, yeah. his part was, was, was verbalizing that darkness and those dark corners. Uh, yeah. You know, and their job was to it was it was all part and parcel together. Everything worked to create like a just a, an oral kind of diorama of of what was going on from the music, from the drums being all strange and yeah, you know, seemingly disconnected. But it, when you listen to these songs, it's cre and that's why they're they're probably you know <laughs> they're called they've been called creepy, you know. Uh, you know, depending on, on where you're at when you're coming from this or, or what you listen to, you know, if you listen to the soft parade, yeah, you might not get it. It's a little, that's very poppy, mm -hmm. you know, but the, but the first two albums and, and this one especially is, yeah, like you said, it's kind of, this one's a little bit of a, not dour. No. Um, and, and not depressing, but dark, but, but kind dark. of darker or, or melancholy themes, right? Well, like just the titles, you know, your lost little girl. Unhappy I can't girl. See, I can't see your face in my mind. Yeah. Unhappy yeah. girl. Mm-hmm. You know, strange days when the music's over. So, you know, the 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 content is not "I want to hold your hand." She loves you. Yeah. You know, good day, sunshine. <laughs> right. It's 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 the it's well, the other it's the other side. It's the it's, darker it's underbelly. The, dark, that. the underbelly, and it's a, and yeah. it is a complete thought. Like I said, yeah. I mean, it's like it's uh, you know very thematically, it's very cohesive. Whereas you know. Other albums that they did, they had to slip in something that they probably didn't want to slip in. You know, that's where Krieger came in. He's like, I have to write a hit song. You know, maybe there's just there's not enough of that on the first, you know, on their debut. They needed something to to kind of off balance that, you know, they I'm sure Morrison probably wanted to put quite a few of these songs on <laughs> on the first. Can you imagine this being the first album? You know, I don't I don't know how, you know, how that would have been you know. Well, I mean, it was, a, it was a well, it was a wealth of material they had. I mean, the, the, like I said, the stuff on on the previous album really wasn't that far off. I mean, you know, end of the night from from the first album, the Crystal Ship, Soul Kitchen. I mean, some of that stuff is again, all this stuff is just a break on through. I mean, these are again, these are just generally not, yeah, poppy. Uh, sunny side of the sunny side of life songs you know <laughs> right you just right. generally you can go album to album yeah you know the next album summer is almost gone wintertime love five to one i mean their songs are generally you know until mm -hmm. you get to touch me which morrison really didn't want to uh didn't want to do and or the song uh from soft parade follow me down mm -hmm. you know he didn't R robbie krieger wrote that he goes i don't want to sing and tell people to follow me i don't want i'm not that i don't want yeah. I don't want to put that message out there, but you know, they did it. <laughs> so, so, you know, those, those dark themes pretty much run throughout. You can kind of, you know, and it's a, yeah, it's like I said, it's a different, you know, I think after going, going through the Beatles and going through that, you know, it, it preps you maybe for, for the darker stuff, you know, and that's when you get into the doors because you've kind of been through the Beatles experience where it's all kind of, you know, poppy like for the most part positive there's not a lot of downer songs maybe helter skelter you could probably pick a handful mm -hmm. um even their darker stuff like you know run for your life from the beatles it's it's not threatening yeah you know it's yeah. kind of it's it, it, for the beatles it's threatening but but when you when you 
kind of put it up, up against like Jefferson Airplane and, and some of the, psych- the psychedelic stuff goes a little deeper. It goes into the psyche. A little Hel- more. Helter Skelter might be the, the, the extreme. Yeah. Probably at that point, you know, but, yeah, happiness uh, yeah. is a warm gun and stuff yeah. like that. But, but even, but the, even that doesn't go as, as kind of creepy and weird as right. airplane. And right. as the, you know, as you know, I, I always look at the Jefferson airplane and the doors kind of, kind of in tandem, they were kind of running at the same level mm-hmm. uh, and kind of, and kind of dealing with the same themes and kind of uh, exploring the same musical areas, right. They, you know, the stuff from airplane wasn't right happy go lucky either it was the you know dark and creepy and strange and weird you know that that other side of it yep of the of the the summer of love you know there's there was a dark <laughs> there is there was a dark underbelly a dark to streak it, right? of right exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's what and that's what the door that's what the doors you know that's what they were exploring and i think there's there's absolutely it wasn't satanist or devil music it was just a different you know, a, a different look at emotions and a different look at how things are perceived, mm-hmm. which I appreciated when I was getting into them. I was like, yeah, this is just a whole different, a whole other aspect of music and a whole other way to look at lyrical content and, and kind of pulling it apart. And what, what is a band trying to say? Um, especially coming from something like the Beatles, which is very well produced, well organized, well written, well arranged. And then this, this is disjoint. You're getting stuff that's disjointed and just not, you know, you're getting challenged on a different level for the mm-hmm. music, you know, that the Beatles would challenge you in one way um, just with the experimentation and what they were doing. And this is just something, you know, when I got into them, I was like, wow, this is just totally different. Yeah. Well, maybe yeah. that's what, what it was. Is I, I didn't get right into the Beach Boys or another pop band right into it right afterwards, because that would have probably wouldn't have worked anyway. It's kind of like, you know, just stumbled upon. I read the book. No one here gets out alive. Once you read that book back then, every, whoever read that book back when it came out. That's became right. enamored as much of it is is probably not true and, and much of it is probably fiction <laughs> um it was a compelling read and it was a great if it's a fable it's a great fable Absolutely. yeah you know if it's great fiction it, you know if, if 25 or, or, or 50 percent of it is true whatever um it it, it kind of grew the legend and that's and i read that i'm like oh my god this guy i gotta ch-, you know and then you kind of just you go down the rabbit hole densmore's book is is great too this was right. good. I read that one. Supposedly Krieger's is real is even better. Supposedly, yeah. supposedly it's a little more uh, realistic. Densmore's was more like oh, you know, very metaphysical, and I was going to acting classes and whatever. <laughs> he talks at length about like the the problems that he had. You know his disgruntled uh, <laughs> because I wish know. I would have told Jim this how I felt. It's like you know, okay, right, exactly. Everybody yeah, does some so, good stories, you know. But give the, uh, yeah, give us the dirt. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's what you want. We want we want the dirt under the fingernails. <laughs> that's what we want from the Doors, because that's that's what they were. They were that you know. Yeah, uh, they were that band, and and they they absolutely left their mark on rock and roll. And as, as short as it was, it's endure his his image is enduring. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and maybe maybe that's the blessing and the curse, right? For when he was alive, it was a curse. Um, now that he's passed, that image of the young godlike, the young lion, uh, Morrison is, has become iconic. So now people see that it's still on t-shirts and in art. Who is this guy? Mm-hmm. Right. Who is he? And and then that, you know, how corny opens the doors to, to finding out about them and listening <clears throat> to them now and, and getting into them. That's um, what he wanted. So, I, I, who knows? I, I'm not sure. So. Who knows? Who knows? I mean, you know, I, I like to think if he, if he was still alive, he probably would have been kind of like a Van Morrison kind of, you know, went that trajectory of, of kind of doing kind of straight, just kind of weird stuff, strange stuff, traditional stuff, Extra, you know, more of the poetry. Extra. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. like kind of not really going down a, 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 a standard career path, you know, cause he had, he had nothing but opportunities available to him to do what, what he wanted or not wanted to do. You mm-hmm. know? And again, there's still, there was always talk about, were they going to get back together? They were supposed to be getting back together, the doors, and then he passed away. So that's, you know, we, we covered that in the episode three. And we're on episode 100 and some, It was like 100 episodes ago. So go, yeah, right? go, Over find, go find that episode. It's somewhere in the back underneath the newspapers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so so what, what, are some, what are some of the highlights here for you? For me? Oof. Yeah. Jeez. Um, I don't know. I think I like... Unhappy Girl, I love. I love My yeah. Eyes Have Seen You. It was always one of my favorite tracks. Yeah. I never 
at the time back then when I it was like I could probably say that might have been my favorite song when we uh-huh. were first just getting into them. Like the three, you know, our friend John was a big fan. Yep. Um, we I think we all had our favorites, particular favorites. That was probably I didn't know which album it came from at the time. Um, but I was I'm glad that it's on this particular album. Yeah. Uh, I can't see your face in my mind. Yep, uh, I would one probably, of my I probably, you know, aside from strange days and which is, you know, it's hard. It's hard. I like the whole, I mean, every song There's no bad song <laughs> on this record. Honestly, no, because, not. because you can go right through. I mean, it's like, it's not, you don't have to labor through any of these songs. It's, it's, it, you know, like I said, they're, none of them exceed four minutes, you know? So it's a very easy album to listen to, to get through, yeah. but it's, it's also, but you're also in for quite a ride because it has that, you know, just that uh, that darkness to it. Yeah, just enough of that. And it's, and it's trippy. Exactly. Yeah. I used to it's, I used to really kind of not, not be down on it, but kind of really dismiss Moonlight Drive just because it was really a big FM staple. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't listened to this album in a while, so when I started listening to it for the for this episode, I'm like, and maybe I needed to miss it. Maybe that's what it was. Come listening. I'm like, wow, I'm really digging Moonlight Drive. And I normally don't. It's like, I'll, you know, I'll take it or leave it. It's kind of like, mm-hmm. it's one of the ones that's there. And I'm, yeah. but when I was listening to it now, I'm like, yeah, I, I'm kind of digging, you know, I'm kind of digging Moonlight Drive again. I really kind of, you know, the, you know, Robbie Krieger's guitar work. Again, you're not going to go wrong with him. The guy doesn't, he doesn't miss a trick. He's just so no. fluid uh, and just so great. You know, he, he, I just, I love listening to Robbie Krieger play. I mean, he's mm-hmm. just, because he's not like any, he's not like any other guitar player. Um, yeah. And I don't know what that means. I don't know what it means. It just means that he's different. Yeah. Um, his solos are different. His just, just because of the way he plays his flamenco style again, like, like Lindsey Buckingham, it, it, le- it becomes a, you automatically become, or like Mark Knopfler, you become like a different guitar player. Mm-hmm. You know, because because your your sensibilities are coming from a different way of playing. Well, you're you know, you're, you're serving the song. You're serving yeah. it's you know you're painting that as Lindsay would put it. It's like painting a picture, right? Yeah. It's those flourishes of what 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 do we need here? It's not just a straight up you know just guitar lead guitar rhythm guitar. You're talking about it's like I said before, like Krieger's in Krieger's case, you have these weird like like he's just you know that's that makes the song you know whereas otherwise it would have been probably just had they yeah, those, did, those the little accents in, in the demos which probably sounded nothing like the way it does you know so those little it, it it lends to that it's like a voice almost like a background voice like you know accenting what morrison's yeah. doing you know yeah, and, like, and the, the the story famously is i don't know if we covered it on on the la woman episode but uh, the first time Morrison heard Robbie Krieger play slide guitar, he said, "That's all I ever want on, on. That's all I ever want on the records is slide guitars." Like, well, you we can't, yeah. you can't all be. <laughs> you know, it, it would wear out its welcome, but but he really is a great slide guitar, different different than a George Harrison or different than a Clapton. He does he uses it in, like you said, in, in for accents. Um, yeah, these little for, short for, fra- yeah, for phrasing. It's not. Um, it's not. I, I can't imagine. I mean, that's not easy to do. I mean, these, I mean, you're talking about these little short bursts of yeah. to actually, you know, know precisely where to hit the note on a, on a, on a bottleneck yeah. is, is wild child. I love his guitar yeah. work on wild child. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I yeah. Love that song. Yeah. <laughs> if we were ever to do a top guitar player episode, which would be extremely difficult. I, I, he would, I probably would have forgotten about him. Like I would be so keyed in on, on being, you know, cool, you know, figuring out something okay. like I, much like I left out John Deacon out of our bass players. Cause he was so obvious. Okay. That I was trying to outthink the list that I probably, I probably would, if you had done it, I probably would have left off Robbie Krieger. Like I probably would have just totally blanked I, on him, but he absolutely would, should, would be on there. He should be on there. I, I think so. Yeah. I would, absolutely. I would, that would probably be an overlap <laughs> for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and no or it would be an oversight if I didn't have it on there. It would mm-hmm. just be like, if if you said Robbie Krieger, I would have been like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. Because one of us would yeah. have picked him. And it would yeah, have no, but it's just like, you know, because they're so low key. It's like, because, you know, because he didn't do it. Like, it's not like. Um, and that's the way I like it, though, man. That's the, you know, those are my favorite type of players. That's the who, sin. That's you know, the sin is, is the door's broke up and they didn't do anything afterwards. It's not like mm. Robbie Krieger 
you know, they, they kind of struggled. I mean, you know, they kind of did stuff, but yeah. it's not like they kind of went on and, and, you know, not like, like Dave Grohl in Nirvana, like, Oh, I'm going to go and just do something else. It's not like Robbie Krieger was able to latch on to something else. He made a couple of solo albums. He made a great, a great solo album called no Abla. I think it was in the eighties, which was really great mm-hmm. um, or early nineties, but not, but, but kind of, because the the specter and the shadow of Morrison was so big that mm-hmm. when the band ex- kind of extinguished it, everyone else was just kind of collateral damage. Like they just kind of get, became footnotes, unfortunately, you know? Yeah. And yeah. the guy was too good. Like, you know, that, that should not like six albums should not be the legacy. You know, again, yes, he's put out a lot of solo stuff, but no one's going to go listen to that. You mm-hmm. know, he's going to be known for the work that he did on, on, on these six albums, which are incredible, but it's not enough. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. not enough. It's, and, and same thing with Manzarek and, and John Densmore. It's not enough. And and they tried to make a go of it without him and no one's interested. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. it's not the same. So uh, unfortunately they, they couldn't pivot, you know, <laughs> make, make that adjustment and, and kind of course correct and, and do something else. You know, it's too bad. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. It's just way too talented. Yeah. You know? And that's, I mean, the same could be said of a lot of people out there too. It's just struggling to, to make it they might have had their moment in the sun and just so you know just kind of fizzled out and yeah but uh yeah Not too well, bad. i don't know yeah but just for 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 highlights for me i think you hit like your lost little girl uh you can't see my can't see your face in my mind and of course when the music's over that's like that's like oh, that's like that's, like that's like that's like that's like five songs in one based on the running time of the other ones it's like getting five <laughs> that's like getting five to one um yeah but from, <laughs> but, that was, but that was for me i remember hearing that i i, I think i always like that more than the end mm-hmm. you know when the music's over yeah. i remember hearing listening to weird scenes probably was the first doors album i ever had and it uh, you know fortunately it had like a lot of the this good stuff on there yeah you know from i would the first even go with the weird. soft i would go with the soft parade over this one as far as the epic songs too i, mm-hmm. I you know like each one that kind of amped it up a little bit. And I, I really liked the soft parade. That was kind of, yeah. Uh, for an album that was very poppy and that, you know, kind of like the doors, that would be the doors at their weakest was, the, was the soft parade. I really like the song, the soft parade, but mm-hmm. anyway, what do you think? We you think we covered all the bases on. Uh, I think so. On this album? I, yeah. I think we needed yeah. to say what we needed to say, but uh, yeah. it's, it's, I'm, 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 glad, I'm glad we chose this one. It's a good yeah. contrast to, uh, uh, to, to, the the album that we did which was the door the doors by then a fully a fully kind of formed blues band mm-hmm. um no there you know no shades there are on, on ellie woman there are no shades of this album or of this band like like this after this, this after this album it was, it was pretty much shed like like waiting for the sun had doesn't really have a lot in common with this although it was the next album mm-hmm. by ellie woman they were they were a different they were a changeling they were something entirely different Mm-hmm. you know and and in a good way like they 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 had a short trajectory but I, like i said every two two album cycles if you look at it in two album chunks you can kind of see their how they're how they metamorphosized uh into what they ended up with yeah you know they really kind of developed uh in pretty short order so mm-hmm. they're very prolific over that time too so 67 yeah. to 71 six albums <laughs> that's four that's four years yeah that's it's four crazy. years. It's crazy. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's not counting. They put out a lot, you know, absolutely live. And there's a couple, even a couple, a couple of compilations in there thrown into those don't count. But mm-hmm. uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's going to do it. That's our famous. That's one of our famous catchphrases. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to do it for this episode of the 3324 podcast. Find us on Facebook and Instagram. Won't you at 3324 podcast, <sighs> a great community of people there. Uh, mm-hmm. like-minded music lovers, movie lovers, great, great hitting our stride commentary, um, with, with people that really engage in the community. Uh, we invite you to be a part of that. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. Nope. Well, um, you know, you got to pay for your internet or you got to pay for your <laughs> cell phone, but that's, that's on you. Outside <laughs> of that. yeah, uh, once you get through that barrier, yeah. it's free to get in. You don't, there's no height. It's not like, like at, at the amusement park, you got to be this tall or to enter, all heights you're in <laughs> that's you're right in. We, we accept everybody so come join us find us on on social media it's a lot of fun it's a great community um we also do live shows as well so you can find that out too that's a way to interact with us directly and uh 
and meet you. Cause, cause that's what this is all about is connecting music and memories and movies and, and friends and kind of, uh, uh, talking about this and sharing our love. So mm-hmm. Did yeah. I say that succinctly? Was that good? You absolutely did. You hit it right on the head. Couldn't have said it right. Right myself. There's no way I could have said any. <laughs> All right. I didn't even write any of this down. It just rolls. See, there you go. It just there rolls. Go. So that'll do it. We we thank you. And uh, check out the doors. It, it is available on, on the streaming services. So you can get it on Spotify and iTunes. Which, which Pick your poison, whichever one you like. It's there. Uh, like Eric said, it's a short listen. So you'll, you know, one song. I'll put it this way. the One song is like, a third of the album mm-hmm. almost. <laughs> yeah. So, so a lot of the other, they're, they're quick, quick bites of, of psychedelic pop art, poetry nuggets of music, but, but check this one out. It is, it is a nice contrast to Ellie woman. So uh, that'll do it for this one. Check us out uh, on YouTube as well. If I haven't said that at the beginning, I'm saying it again. Now, if you've been with us this way throughout the whole thing, thanks for sticking with us on YouTube. We appreciate it as well. So for Eric, this has been Dean. We will catch you. On the flip side, you've been listening to the 3324 podcast with Dean Legiro and Eric Cooper. You can find us on your favorite podcast provider. So please like, subscribe, and rate to become a part of the 3324 family. Your feedback is important. So make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at 3324 Podcast and on Twitter at 3324P to join the conversation. 